Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, meeting of the Greater Hammond Chamber of Commerce. Where we're going to learn today fun facts uh, about an exciting event that's going to occur this Monday afternoon. Now, I'd like to uh, bring up to the front that the guy who is really responsible for this, it was his idea to put together this meeting, so we're grateful to that, Mr. Alvin uh, Brumfield, who uh, operates the Renaissance Fair, which is coming up toward the end of November. If you've never been there, you got to go. It's the most fun thing. I promise you'll be back and bringing friends like, like I do. And I've been going, what, four years now? I go every year, sometimes twice in a year. It's a lot of fun. Alvin, come on up, some, come on up and tell us. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. Um, well, originally, uh, several weeks ago, I said, hey, you know, this eclipse thing's coming. We haven't heard much about it yet. Um, and I said, well, let's, let's get some sunglasses together for the, the kids. So um, I said, well, we've got to raise money to get the glasses. So uh, Joe Mir, an associate, stepped up and helped us buy the glasses along with Vitaco Bubbles. I said, that's awesome. Then Amazon sends us these notes. Well, some of the glasses we sent you aren't any good. It's like, all right, well, we'll just go get some more. Well, nah, that's not going to happen. So, uh, so unfortunately, we won't be able to do that. But also at the same time, I'd ask the chamber, I said, hey, we have that education committee, you know, that, that works with the schools and education, what can we do? And uh, so the Greater Hammond area, I'm sorry, the Greater, Cha Greater Hammond Chamber at, said, um, well, what do you have in mind? I said, well, why don't we just get together and get, get some people to talk about it, get some fun facts as well as some, some actual safety things going. And she goes, well, is Southeastern doing anything? I said, I don't know. So we called Southeastern and they said, no, we're not doing anything. But we'll put it out there and see if anybody's interested. And uh, Dr. Uh, Blanchard and Dr. Robeson said, yeah, we'll do that. That sounds like fun. So thanks to the, the, the Greater Hammond Chamber and, and these two great gentlemen for stepping up and helping us do this. Hopefully it'll be entertaining, educational, and of course everybody that showed up today got their free actual solar eclipse glasses, the good ones. We gave you the good ones today. So, um, Lab certified. <laughs> so, um, and they'll talk more about that, I, I assume. So thanks again for coming. Thank you, Alan. Great, great idea, by the way. Thank, thank you for doing this. Also, I, I would like to thank Action News 17 and Channel 17 for recording this program at, because after this event, we're actually going to share this with the students and teachers uh, in, in our local schools. So they'll, they'll be able to hear the same kind of facts that you're going to hear today and learn more about the uh, solar eclipse event. All right. I'd now like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Gerald Blanchard, the head of the chemistry and physics department at Southeastern, specializes in space physics, which is the study of the volume of space between the photosphere of the sun and the atmosphere of the planets. He studies the solar wind, Earth's magnetic field, and the Earth's ionosphere, which is the outer region of Earth's atmosphere. Dr. William Robeson, the head of Southeastern history, Southeastern's History and Political Science Department specializes in British history and European history after 1500. He's a popular fanfare speaker, giving his more or less annual Halloween lecture on topics from the life, death, and abandoned bones of Richard III to poisons and potions in history. And he's going to tell you about what you just drank back there. To the, to the historical adventures of Doctor Who, one of my favorites. Gentlemen, take it away. All right. Well, first of all, thanks to the, the Greater Hammer, Hammond Chamber of Commerce for having us here and also to Alvin for putting it together. Uh, if, if Alvin can't organize something, it cannot be organized. And of course, since this is going out to uh, classrooms uh, around the parish and elsewhere, I also want to uh, wish the students uh, a good academic year and thank the teachers out there for all that you do. Uh, we get your students eventually and we appreciate what you do for them. Uh, I also want to thank Southeastern for making this possible, for uh, the alumni uh, uh, house being open to us, and to all of you for coming out early in the morning. Uh, it was probably risky to feed Gerard and me a big breakfast before this, but I will try not to fall asleep during my own talk. All right, this is the history part. Uh, in 1889, Mark Twain published a novel called A Yankee in, or Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, in which a guy by the name of Hank Morgan 
accidentally travels in time back to the court of King Arthur. And the climactic scene in this book is one in which he outdoes the wizard Merlin by predicting a solar eclipse that, of course, he already knew about since he was from the future. Um, Sixty years later, this was made into a movie with Bing Crosby starring as Hank. Uh, it's, it's a frightening movie in a lot of ways, um, seeing Bing Crosby sing about eclipses. Uh, but the climactic scene is the eclipse, and the crowd is absolutely terrified. And so he achieves his purpose. So where does Mark Twain get this? Well, he tells us, parenthetically, that he got the idea from Columbus. Uh, during Columbus's uh, voyage to Jamaica in 1504, he encountered hostile Arawak Indians, and he managed to persuade them that he had a, a degree of occult power, if you will, by predicting a lunar eclipse that he knew was coming because he had read the predictions of uh, a late medieval scientist by the name of Regio Montanus and he probably survives in 1504 as a result of that. Twain knew about it and incorporated the gimmick into a Connecticut Yankee. Uh, the Indian chief Tecumseh, or perhaps his brother, Tenskwatawa, who was known as the prophet, predicted two eclipses in 1806 and 1811, as well as the New Madrid earthquake, and thereby were able to unite the Shawnee tribes in resisting the incursions of uh, white settlers. Also got a lawnmower named for him. Uh, now, the, the interesting thing about this is that although Tecumseh was resisting white settlers, he had uh, a, a close friend uh, who was a white man who had an almanac. And it's quite possible that Tecumseh saw predictions about the eclipses in the almanac and pulled basically the same gimmick as Columbus had done. Um, H. Ryder Haggard who in 1885, shortly before Connecticut Yankee, wrote uh, the novel King Solomon's Mines, has Alan Quartermain predict a lunar eclipse to get himself out of a jam. Uh, and even the graphic novel Tintin uh, by Belgian cartoonist Herhe has Tintin trick the Incas by predicting a solar eclipse that he already knew about, something that he has done in numerous adaptations of this comic book, uh, movies, a musical, and even a video game. So, what is the big deal? Well, solar eclipses are spooky. If you've ever experienced one, it gets dark, the wind starts to blow, the birds go crazy, uh, it, it gets a lot cooler really, really quick, and if you didn't know what was going on, it probably would scare the daylights out of you. But there's more to the story than just that. Think about the pre-modern sky. <laughs> Prior to the 20th century, people were much, much more aware of the sky than we are or than we can be because they had no light pollution. You can't go stand out in the middle of Hammond at night and look at the sky and see what people could see 200 years ago because there's just too much light. Also, they had fewer distractions. Nothing on television, you know, they're not inside waiting for Game of Thrones to come on. They're probably outside looking at the sky and noticing what goes on up there. And of course, people prior to the 20th century and a fair number of people since the beginning of the 20th century are notoriously superstitious. So what they saw in the sky mattered. And what they saw there were various celestial omens. Everybody in the ancient world, everybody in the Middle Ages saw omens in the sky. Uh, they didn't know the science behind what they were seeing, and they believed it had some sort of supernatural import. So solar and lunar eclipses are huge. Um, comets are a big, big deal, uh, and, uh, assuming that they, they look like more than that little fuzzy cotton ball we got in 1986 with Halley's. Uh, meteor showers are a big deal. Nova, or, or novi, new stars are a big deal. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that ancient pagan religions, which were polytheistic, that is, had multiple gods, often worshipped the sun, the moon, and even the stars, looked for signs in the sky to uh, discern what the gods were up to, and therefore made astrology, not astronomy, but astrology, uh, into a huge part of their lives. So an astrologer 
uh, unlike being the, the odd little guy at the edge of uh, Jackson Square now, was a hugely important person. Um, in China, there was a belief that uh, the dra a dragon eats the sun during an eclipse, which I gotta admit is a lot more fun than the actual explanation. <laughs> um, the Greeks believed that an eclipse was the sign that the gods were angry and that Helios, the sun god, who the Romans knew as Apollo, uh, demonstrated his unhappiness by leaving the sky for a while. Left in a huff, if you will. Uh, in Korea, they believed that the ball guy, or fire dog, eats the sun. In India, they believed that the demon Rahu eats the sun. Looks more like a grapefruit to me, but... Uh, that's the sun, apparently. Uh, Native American tribes in the Southwest, like the Hopi and the Tiwa, believed that a bear eats the sun. Personally, I find that one pretty compelling. In Vietnam, they believed that a giant frog eats the sun. That's not the actual frog, I don't <laughs> think, but uh, it's, it's the best, best giant frog I could come up with. Vikings believed that the wolf Fenrir eats the sun. And then along comes monotheism. The three, you know, great monotheistic religions. Uh, Judaism, of course, existed in the ancient Near East, but was very much a minority religion. Uh, Christianity comes along uh, at the beginning of the Common Era, and it grows from being a tiny little sect to being the dominant religion in the Roman Empire. And Islam comes along in the 7th century and quickly grows to be gigantic as well. Well, monotheistic religions don't worship the sun. They don't worship the moon, they don't worship the stars, they all have one God. But early on, they didn't necessarily discount what had come before. What's different is this, they believe that everything in the universe is ordained by the one God. And it doesn't change, so they thought. Now. If it doesn't change and something weird happens like an eclipse or a comet or a meteor shower or a new star, that's abnormal. That must have supernatural significance. That must indicate that God is doing something or indicating something or that perhaps that other supernatural entity, the devil, is up to something. So astrology is actually incorporated into the early practice of Judaism, Christianity, and uh, Islam. Not so much anymore, and not really an essential element, but it's there. If you look at this illustration on the screen, it shows the zodiac with Jesus sitting in the middle of it. Now, it's not biblical, but it's what people did. And, of course, everybody in the Middle Ages believed not only in astrology, but in magic and miracles, and to some extent in witchcraft. So it was possible to associate celestial phenomena with those things. Um, and in fact, there may have been a Hebrew eclipse uh, going back about a, a, a millennium before that. We know the story of Joshua at the Battle of Gibeon where the sun stood still in the sky. Or maybe what actually happened was an eclipse. You can translate the Hebrew word either as the sun stood still or the sun became dark. Well, we don't know, but uh, Gustav Dore makes an interesting picture out of it. Um, it is possible that there was an eclipse at the time of Christ's crucifixion that explains why the sky suddenly got dark. Um, it presents a little bit of a problem with dating, but we've already got a little bit of a problem with dating that event anyway. And there was an eclipse the year that Muhammad was born uh, in 570 AD, although he later denied that God would have bothered to make an eclipse happen just because he was being born. At any rate, there are a bunch of other historical eclipses, and this is just a few of them. There, there are zillions of them if you really want to go and look for them. Um, one particularly unfortunate eclipse occurred in 2137 BC. Uh, eclipses were thought to be bad luck for the ruler. So rulers wanted to know ahead of time when an eclipse was coming so they could take precautionary measures. And, um, the Emperor Chung Kang had two astrologers named Si and Ho who were supposed to predict eclipses, but evidently had uh, been imbibing a little too much and did not do so, and were beheaded for failing to predict the eclipse when it showed up. I don't think that Gerard and I have to worry about that happening, at least I hope not. Um, 
In the book of Genesis, um, there is uh, what is apparently an eclipse involving Abraham when he's in Canaan, uh, where it says that great darkness fell upon him as the sun was going down. Uh, there is one, uh, there actually are a lot of eclipses recorded by the Babylonians, including the great Ugarit eclipse of 1233 BC. They also thought eclipses were bad luck and actually would hide the king and appoint a substitute king to incur the wrath of the gods and then put the real king back in place. Um, this is uh, what you see in the picture there is a Babylonian star chart. Uh, Odysseus supposedly returned from his journeys during an eclipse in 1178. Uh, Theoclamenus uh, observes the sun has been obliterated from the sky and an unlucky darkness invades the world. Uh, there was an Assyrian eclipse in 763 BC that was associated with an insurrection in the city of Asher, named for the god Asher, who you see uh, there in the illustration. Uh, Archilochus, the poet, uh, described an eclipse in 648 where Zeus, the father of the, Ol of the Olympians, made darkness from midday. That's not Zeus, that's Asher again. I don't know how that happened. Thales of Miletus, an early, a great early mathematician, was reported by the historian Herodotus to have predicted an eclipse in 585. And interestingly enough, the kingdoms of the Lydians and the Medes were at war at that year, and when an eclipse occurred, they saw this as a sign from the gods that they were doing the wrong thing, made peace, and went home. That's, that's not a bad outcome. Um, Louis the Pious in 840 AD died shortly after ending a civil war with his sons and observing an eclipse. Three years later, his sons made peace, and the eclipse was seen as an omen for that. Um, Halley's Comet, this is not an eclipse, but I just can't resist this one, uh, showed up in 1066. It wasn't called Halley's Comet yet because Halley hadn't been born yet, but it was seen as an open of um, William the Conqueror's invasion of England, and you can see it there up at the top of the Bayou Tapestry. Um, Henry I's eclipse in 1133 was believed to be an omen for his death. This is probably a bad subject to bring up right after breakfast, but what really killed Henry was eating a surfeit of eels. He ate so much that it killed him. Um, eels. There was a famous eclipse in Scotland called the Black Hour of 1433 in the reign of James I that absolutely terrified everybody there. And this is not an eclipse either, but a good example of how celestial phenomena can scare the daylights out of people. Tycho Brahe was a, a Danish astronomer and astrologer who discovered a new star, or a nova, uh, in 1572 in the constellation Cassiopeia. We now know that it was a supernova, but it undermined the tradition that the universe is uh, unchanging and helped bring along uh, the, the already um, developing scientific revolution. There were a bunch of comets, three in one year in 1618, seen as an omen that predicted the beginning of the Thirty Years' War. They even struck memorial tokens, uh, as you can see right here. And the eclipse of 1652 was subsequently seen as an omen of the 1665 Plague of London and the 1666 Fire of London. Now, there's a lot more of those, but I want to sort of end here where I started with Mark Twain, because I like Mark Twain. And um, in this case, a comet. 1909, Mark Twain pointed out accurately, I came in with Halley's Comet in 1835. It is coming again next year, and I expect to go out with it. It will be the greatest disappointment of my life if I don't go out with Halley's Comet. He did. Twain died in 1910. Now, a lot of other people expected to die, too. My grandmother, who was uh, 25, or a little bit older at the time, um, remembered being terrified by Halley's Comet, which was quite impressive in uh, 1910. People panicked. Uh, you could buy comet pills to keep you from being made sick by the cloud. And many people predicted the end of the world. I bring that up because a lot of people are predicting the end of the world next week. So I'm, I'm not paying any of my bills until after August the 21st. Um, 
at any rate, th th there are various groups pr predicting that the world will end as a result of this eclipse. Uh, the Daily Star says so, so it must be true, right? Well, maybe not, because the Daily Star also told us about killer spiders making a man's leg explode, uh, seagull terror, lock up your babies, and monster rats the size of cows. So I think a certain amount of scientific skepticism might be called for here. Uh, another story is that the giant planet Nibiru will destroy the Earth. Uh, I consulted uh, an expert on this, and uh, Doctor Who says no. Um, <laughs> And uh, the doctor says no, and so do I. So let's see what Professor Blanchard has to say about it. Thank you, Dr. Rowison. He's a hard act to follow, but I'll do my best. There we go. Uh, I want to go back over a few of these eclipses that Dr. Robeson mentioned, those that gave us some scientific advances that would not have been possible without, uh, without eclipses. And the first that I'm going to point to happened in 189 BC, where Hipparchus actually used the eclipse to measure the distance to the moon. And if you ever think about that, how on earth would you measure the distance to the moon? And he did, using, using the eclipse. He, uh, he was in modern-day Istanbul, or close to it, and uh, he had a friend in Alexandria, and they both made observations of the uh, solar eclipse. They saw a slightly different uh, paths of the moon over the sun and using that and some geometry they actually could calculate the distance from the earth to the moon. Another, another eclipse that gave us a discovery that wouldn't have been possible otherwise is that actually two uh, scientists, one English and one French, uh, using the same eclipse in 1868 discovered helium using, uh, using observations of the sun's corona that they couldn't have uh, observed otherwise without the sun blocking it out. Now, nowadays, we can make those observations using satellites w uh, up in space with a disk blocking out the sun so that they, uh, they could have an artificial eclipse whenever they wanted, but back then they didn't have that, so they had to use the natural phenomenon that happened so that they could see the sun's corona and make these measurements. Uh, in 1919, uh, an observation of an eclipse uh, confirmed Einstein's theory of general relativity. They, they looked at the sun during the eclipse and what happened is, is the stars near the sun appeared to move away from the sun due to the effect of gravity on light. And that was the first confirmation of uh, general relativity. Uh, we had another recent one recently uh, out at LIGO. They observed gravitational waves and that's further confirmation of that. But the first one was actually happened during an eclipse. Now, all of these advances were possible because they could predict the eclipses. They didn't just pop out one day and say, oh, there's an eclipse, let me, get my, uh, let me get my equipment ready. No, they knew ahead of time that that was coming. So how, how do we predict eclipses? Well, okay, what, what's the recipe for a solar eclipse? First, we need a new moon. You know, the, the moon goes around the Earth. When we have a new moon, we're looking at the side that's not illuminated by the sun. So the moon is between the Earth and the sun. So do we see eclipses every month? No. So it's a little bit more than that. Not just, not just a new moon. And the reason for that is that the, uh, for an eclipse, the sun, the, uh, the earth, and the moon all have to be in a straight line. And that we call that syzygy. I, I like that word. Cool word. <laughs> Syzygy, uh, it's a Greek word, it actually means a yoke, like if you have three oxen in a line with a yoke, uh, that's the, the yoke is the syzygy, but now it means the, the three objects in a line. And not every new moon puts the earth, the moon, and the sun in a straight line, and why is that? Here we have the sun, and here we have the earth orbiting around the sun in a plane. Well, the moon orbits around the earth in a slightly different plane. It's tilted by about five degrees. So you have the plane of the Earth uh, orbiting around the sun and the plane of the moon orbiting around the sun. So they're, they don't, they're not all in the same plane. So even though this is a new moon and this is a new moon and this is a new moon and this is a new moon, let's take a look at this one right here. In this case, the moon's orbit is tilted so that the shadow of the moon doesn't hit the Earth. Or from the point of view of the Earth, the moon passes over the sun at new moon. And uh, 
but at two times during the year where the where the moon's orbit plane and the and the earth's orbit plane intersect we get a line called the line of nodes and when the new moon happens on that line of nodes then we get an eclipse so we so that's twice a year and we call those eclipse seasons now this i know this is a busy figure i'm it's going i'm going to simplify it in just a little bit <coughs> but we get eclipse seasons so let's see here in 2017 we had a solar eclipse in february we had a lunar eclipse in february and this year we have we just had a lunar eclipse we couldn't see it here um, on August the 7th and then a solar eclipse coming up and next year these dates are going to move up slightly so this solar eclipse that happened on February 11th is going to move up to January th 31st the one on February 26th will move up to February 15th and so on so as time goes on these dates move up the calendar so uh, eclipse season doesn't happen at the same time every year it moves up and why is that Okay, this is the same pictures I had before just from the point of view of the Earth, which simplifies things a little bit. Here we have the Earth, we have the Sun appearing to go around the Earth, and where the Sun is, that gives us our months of the year. And then we have the Moon in its orbit going around the Earth, and those two orbits differ by about five degrees. And we get an eclipse when the moon and the sun both meet up at these nodes, the ascending node or the descending node. So whenever they meet up around here, that's the eclipse season. But as things, as things happen, the, uh, the moon's orbit actually moves around. So the orbit itself turns around. So where these nodes are, they rotate around the Earth. So we've got lots of things going on here. We've got, the, we've got the sun appearing to go around the Earth. We've got the moon actually orbiting the Earth. We've got the moon's orbit changing. So we've got all kinds of different cycles interacting here. And when, all the, when we put all these things together, we actually get a cycle of a little bit more than uh, 18 years. And this is known as the Saros cycle. And so one Saros is actually 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours long. So any given eclipse, so the same, the same combination of all these orbital factors, all these different cycles, come together once every 18 years. So there was an eclipse. Uh, let's, we'll start over here. There was an eclipse that happened in Europe in 1945 and then 18 years later that same eclipse happened over North America in 1963 which was 18 years 11 days and eight hours later so it's the eight hours the fact that the earth did make a complete revolution that actually made that eclipse move from Europe to America and then 18 years later that same eclipse happened over um, over Asia in 80, 1981 and then 18 years later it was back over Europe in 1999 and then 18 years after that we get the eclipse coming up on uh, in August 21st 2017 here so one way of predicting an eclipse <laughs> is if if you were here in 1963 and you saw this eclipse right here well you would know that three Saros cycles so three times 18 years, or 54 years later, you would see the same eclipse. And it would, it would move a little bit further south, south or north. Um, a, given eclipse, a given eclipse will move either south or north. So there's, there's many different cycles. This, this eclipse that we're seeing here happens to be one that moves south over time. There are others that move north. So, as I said, one way of predicting an eclipse is if you see an eclipse you, at, a, at a given place, you know that you're going to see a very similar eclipse 54 years later. And the ancients knew this. And how did they know this? Well, they kept good records, for one thing. This, this is 
somebody's notes of an eclipse from 1375 BC. Now, the data that I used for my dissertation was on magnetic tapes, you know, the kind that go around on the computer. And it was unreadable and had to be thrown away 10 years later. Well, this guy's notes are still around, what was that, 3,400 years later. So they kept good records. And with their good records, they were actually able to make computers out of gears. All these cycles of the moon and everything, the, the moon going around the earth, the earth rotating, the sun going around the earth, the orbits rotating. They can mimic all of this using gears. And there's a device, it's called the Antikythera mechanism. It was found off of Antikythera, Greece, in a shipwreck. And uh, this, is, this is what we have today. This is a reproduction. And using all these gears in here, they could turn a crank. They could turn a crank on the front side, and they could actually get predictions of things like eclipses on the other side. So that's a mechanical calculator thousands of years old. Okay, so what do, are we predicted to see come uh, here in Hammond? What are we predicted to see here in Hammond come August 21st? Well, at just around 12 noon, here's the sun. The moon is just going to start to pass in front, of the, uh, in front of the sun. And we're going to see a little bitty bite taken out of the, out of the uh, sun. And then as time goes on, it's going to progressively get further and further in front of the sun. The maximum is going to happen around 1.30 p.m. Now, as dark as this gets, I think that's a little exaggerated. It's not going to get that dark. But uh, the, from, from here in Hammond, the moon is going to cover the sun to about 77%. So we're only going to get about 23% uh, of the normal light. So that's going to be like, uh, you know, late evening, not, not dark. It's not going to be dark. <laughs> not as dark as this for sure. But it's going to be like late evening. Um, the good thing is, is that this is actually going to take an extended period of time. So we're going to have a lot of time to look at this. It's going to take several hours for this to happen. And then after 1.30 p.m., the moon's going to move off. Uh, so it comes down from the, uh, the north, northeast corner, comes down, and then starts heading up to the uh, northwest corner of the sun. So from our point of view, the moon's going to seem to follow this curved path over the sun. And that's actually interesting, too, if you think about it. The moon doesn't, follow a, doesn't go through space in a curved path. It goes through space in a straight line, at least over a sh short distance. Why does it appear to curve? Because we're the ones that are moving. This, this effect that we see of the, the moon appearing to dip down and then go back up in a curve is actually from us, as we're watching it, we start off tilted one way, and then as noon goes, we're tilting over on the surface of the Earth in the other way. And that's what makes the moon appear to follow this curved path. We're actually the ones following the curved path. Okay, so if you want to see this, don't just look at it <laughs> with your naked eye. How can you see it safely? Uh, first, you can look directly at it if you have proper protection. And you have to protect your eyes, not only from the visible light, but also from invisible infrared and ultraviolet light. And you can buy glasses that do that. Uh, as uh, Alvin said, um, you have to buy the right ones. You <laughs> have to buy good ones. You can tell if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your glasses have been tested, any modern glasses that have been tested to protect you from uh, visible light, ultraviolet light, and infrared light will be certified. There's a test that can, I'm sorry, there's a test that can be done and it's the International Standards Organization 123122 two, and you should see that on your glasses. You should see ISO 12312, maybe even 2015, the 2015 specification. So any modern glasses should have that. So if your glasses don't have that, um, then that means that they haven't been tested and no one's guaranteeing that they'll protect you from all the hazards. <laughs> also, unfortunately, referring to what Alvin said, you should also make sure you buy your glasses from a reputable vendor. As things get scarce, there are counterfeits out there. 
Um, the Astrono American Astronomical Society, so at Eclipse at AAS.org, actually has a list of reputable vendors, vendors that they uh, will recommend. And uh, so you can check out, you can make sure you buy your glasses from a reputable vendor. Might be a little bit late to buy glasses now, though. So if you haven't already bought them, uh, might be a little late for that. But you can, you can check to see if your, um, if your glasses are guaranteed by someone reputable. Okay, if you don't have glasses, how else can you look at it? Well, we can do indirect observation. Here I have what's called a sunspotter. It's a solar telescope, very simple. Um, you just point at the sun, and you can see a picture of the sun right here in the middle. Um, these, are, these are good for schools. Uh, they cost about hmm, three to four hundred dollars, so yes. Okay. <laughs> Costs about three to four hundred dollars, but um, they're also useless. There's other things you can do with this sunspot, or not just look at eclipses. Uh, you can look at uh, when we have transits, when the when uh, Mercury or Venus passes in front of the sun. You can see that's really cool. Uh, you can even see the uh, International Space Station pass in front of the sun if you're if you have very good timing. Um, you can also see sunspots. I, I just like to, I, I set this up in my office every morning and check out the sunspots and watch them go across the sun just because that's the kind of thing that I do. <laughs> it's actually kind of neat. You can see the sun rotating as you see the sunspots going across. You can see the sunspots come and go. It's, uh, it's what we call solar minimum right now, so there's not that many of them, but when it's what we call solar maximum, you can see a lot of them. Okay, if you don't, have your glasses and uh, you don't uh, you don't have one of these either you can make your own out of recyclables okay I just I got I picked this up uh, out of our recycling bin at home and put it together in about uh, five minutes it's a uh, pinhole camera so I cut out an opening to look through uh, put a piece of paper in there. There's a little white piece of paper for a screen. That's not necessarily necessary. It just makes things brighter. And took a pin uh, from my uh, wife's sewing kit and poked a pinhole, a little tiny pinhole, just boop, right through. And that's it. That's all that's involved in, uh, in making this. So cut out a hole, make a pin, and you've got yourself a pinhole camera. Now, how do you use it? Well, let's say, uh, let's say that the sun, well, let's say the sun's up there. Okay, if the sun's up there, you're going to want to turn your back to, it, to the sun and hold it like this with the box, with the pinhole pointing at the sun. And then you're going to see a little tiny dot, uh, well, not, not that tiny. You're going to see a little circle that is the sun. And as the eclipse progresses, you're going to see that crescent that I showed you uh, in, in the, uh, on the screen. Now, you can, you can aim it by looking at the shadow on the ground. You want the box to be as much a, as a small a square as possible. That means it's pointed right at the sun. And an interesting thing, I can't give a talk that, the, oops, I lost my equations. Bill, we lost my equations. That's okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, I, I used a longer box, and there's a, there's a reason for that. And that is uh, the longer the box is, the bigger the image of the sun will be. And because, by an interesting coincidence, the distance from the Earth to the sun is 100 times the diameter of the sun, the image that you see in the bottom of the box is going to be 100th of the length of the box. So the longer the box, um, the bigger the image. This box is about 16 inches long. So the image that you see would be 16 hundredths of an inch, which is, which is a decent size. You can see it pretty well. Um, so you can make these really quickly and take a look at the sun. And I have to say, you know, I've done lots of experiments with complicated devices. I still enjoy using, putting something together like this and, uh, and being able to see something that you couldn't ordinarily see through your own craft. So I enjoy doing that. Uh, yeah, a P-I-N, yes, like a needle, like not, not an ink pen, a tiny, tiny hole, a little small hole. It doesn't, doesn't take much. Um, little, and the small, smaller the hole is, the sharper the image you'll get. 
is. Okay, so that's many different ways that you can see the sun. Um, I mean, see the, see the eclipse going on. And you can also plan ahead. There are two <laughs> very good eclipses coming up in only uh, five and six, or six and seven years from now. Uh, there's going to be an eclipse passing. Uh, lost my pen. There's going to be one eclipse on October 23rd, 2023, and October 14th, 2023, and then another eclipse on April 2024. So one eclipse season after the other, we're going to get eclipses passing very close by, even closer than, than the one coming up. And thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Blanchard, Dr. Roberson. Really appreciate that information. That, that was a lot of fun. All right, I, I'm just going to say, say something. I'm traveling tomorrow to go to North Carolina to be in the path of totality on, on uh, Monday in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. But I don't want you to worry if you cannot make that trip. <laughs> We're going to have a total solar eclipse pass right over Hammond, Louisiana. So mark your calendars. You ready for the date? March 30th, 2052. It's coming right over us, 2052. So mark your calendar. All right, thank you very much for coming. Melissa, anything else I need to cover? All right, thank you very much. I hope you had a good time here. Thank you.